okay good morning everyone so like our others like all other mondays we are here to discuss a very important topic another one very very important topic and we can't then imagine and we have seen and we have witnessed many patients uh, many many parents those who, uh, they when they have when their children they have child born with congenital malformation how they feel and how we feel but what should be the responsibility and what how a palliative care team integration integrated palliative care team can help and what are the things which definitely a obstetrician and a neonatologist they should be having there in their mind when such situation comes so for this uh, I, we don't have any clue exactly that what exactly we should do so for this we have two very brilliant uh, people from our team uh, neha so neha will uh, neha will present the topic and uh, dr rakesh garg will moderate so a lot of uh, questions will come in your mind so please write down all the questions in the chat box at the end dr rakesh will take up one by one so neha you can start thank you very much for uh, preparing this topic must be very difficult to start thank, thank you, you. Good morning, all. The topic for today's presentation is uh, congenital malformations in palliative care, and I am Dr. Neha Singh, your presenter for today. And I would like to thank Dr. Rakesh sir for his guidance uh, in preparing this presentation. So, the content, the flow of contents during the seminar is will be in the following order. We'll be first uh, giving a brief overview about pediatric palliative care, since most of the congenital malformations affect the pediatric age group. Then we'll come to introduction to congenital anomalies proper followed by role of genetics. Then we have classified uh, uh, anomalies based on impact of life and uh, given an overview of their management, followed by communication, which is required uh, uh, in breaking bad news in patients with congenital malformation, followed by their advanced care planning and uh, the role of grief and, uh, bereavement in those patients. Then I'll be giving a brief overview of uh, common congenital anomalies, which you may encounter in your practice in pediatric age group, and then I'll be discussing about adults with congenital anomalies and uh, the management and palliative care issues in them. Finally, I'll be ending with a common symptom management with a, a certain, with an overview of, about future perspectives or future research options in this uh, field. So uh, WHO defines pediatric palliative care uh, as effective palliative care for children, which involves giving total care of child body, mind, spirit, and it begins as soon as the illness is diagnosed and continues whether or not the child receives treatment directed at the disease. It requires that the healthcare provider evaluates and alleviates the child's psychological, physical, and social distress. And it requires a multidisciplinary approach, which can be provided at a tertiary care facilities, community health centers, and also at the child's home. So there are certain differences between pediatric palliative care and adult palliative care. Uh, as children, uh, in children, the prognosis, the life expectancy, and the functional outcome is often uh, less clear as compared to that of adults. And the children usually have uh, intensive disease-modifying or life-sustaining treatment, so which is different from that in adult palliative care. And the care often requires a dual focus on growth, development, and potential for death. And there is greater emotional burden for the family. And as the child grows, their physical, hormonal, cognitive, and expressive and emotional needs also change. So palliative care has to evolve with their developmental changes. And certain patients which may have congenital anomalies or uncertain or rare type of genetic conditions, they need palliative care. Uh, uh, and in those uh, patients, multiple children may be affected in the family, which might create a sense of guilt in the parents. So that needs to be addressed as well. So uh, expertise is needed to discern a child's emotional and cognitive development and to communicate in a manner which is appropriate for child's uh, um, in a manner such that information about illness and child's preference for the care can be elicited. So what is the need for the palliative care? Among the total need uh, for palliative care, the congenital anomalies and, uh, uh, account for 25% of total pediatric palliative care needs. And uh, among the congenital anomalies, the child uh, can fall into any of the following categories, that is with acute life-threatening conditions, uh, chronic life-threatening condition, which may be cured or uh, for a long period, but may also cause death, a progressive life-threatening condition for which no curative treatment is available, 
children with severe uh, severe neurological conditions that are progressive but may cause deterioration and death neonates who are severely premature or have severe congenital anomalies and family member of a fetus or a child who dies unexpected unexpectedly so uh, multiple congenital anomalies are there which can fall into any of the following categories so what is a congenital anomalies so it is defined as a structural or functional anomaly that occur during intrauterine life and can be identified prenatally at birth or later in life and it is a major cause of newborn death that is congenital anomalies account for 7% of all neonatal mortalities and it can also result in long term disability with significant impact on child and families the prevalence in india is about 67% of all births uh, the number is approximately 1.7 million and uh, the indian government has formulated a indian national newborn action plan which was formulated in 2014 and it approaches the prevention and care of newborn with birth defects into primary health care so uh, this is a national estimate of the birth prevalence of congenital anomalies in india which says that uh, around 472000 177 congenital anomalies are uh, affected affected births in india each year and the two most commonly identified uh, congenital anomalies were uh, a major first number one is major congenital anomalies such as anencephaly which can cause intrauterine death as well as uh, death at birth and talipus which is a minor congenital anomalies which uh, which in which the child can survive up to adulthood and can be corrected using low cost intervention so what is the etiology of congenital anomalies in 50% of the cases no cause has been identified for a congenital anomalies while in the rest of the 50% of the cases the cause can be a single gene defect chromosomal disorders conditions during pregnancy that affect the baby and genetic and environmental problems so chromosomal uh, abnormalities can lead to trisomy such as down syndrome monosomy uh, and monosomies and single gene abnormalities which can lead to genetic disorders which can uh, be classified as autosomal dominant disorders autosomal recessive disorders and x linked disorders such as duchenne muscular dystrophy and conditions during pregnancy that affect the baby are fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and maternal illnesses such as diabetes which can cause macrocephaly autoimmune diseases and rubella and cytomegalovirus infection during pregnancy which can cause congenital anomalies in the uh, fetus the genetic and environmental issues uh, which can cause congenital anomalies are spina bifida which can occur because of uh, um, neural tube defects which occurs because of deficiency in folate in uh, mother during pregnancy and cleft lip and cleft palate coming to uh, for the diagnosis of just uh, this uh, congenital anomalies genetic testing is available so uh, neurological disease without any unexplained etiology uh, can be uh, considered for diagnosis uh, can be considered for genetic testing these includes epilepsy intellectual disability encephalopathy myopathy or muscular dystrophy and also pediatric cancers can also go for genetic testing if there is positive family history early age of onset and for specific types of cancer so what are the genetic uh, tool, uh, tools available for diagnosing a congenital anomalies so you have karyotyping non invasive prenatal testing microarray fish technique sanger technique pcr techniques next generation sequencing mlpa that is multiplex pcr assay and uniparental disomming so which test to use and when to use that is important so for chromosomal chromosomal anomalies such as aneuploidy microdeletions and uniparental disomy the tests available are uh, you can go for quantification pcr karyotyping microarray and fish technique for single gene defects uh, you can go for single gene panel multiplex pcr assay multi gene panel whole exome analysis and whole genome analysis for metabolic uh, metabolic congenital anomalies you can go for blood gas levels glucose lactate newborn screening at, which is done at the new, uh, newborn screening where you can go for renal function liver function and creatinine kinase amino acids organic acids and acetyl carnitine profile for environmental multifactorial uh, Uh, uh factors which leads to genetic uh, abnormalities besides these you can take history into account to see which factor might have led to the development of congenital anomaly so uh, this is a classification which is not available in textbook and we have tried to classify uh, uh, the congenital malformations uh, based on their impact on life and uh, which the first one being prenatal that is congenital anomalies uh which can cause in utero death these includes uh um anencephaly holoprosencephaly brain brain hypoplasia 
Then in heart disease, you can have unspecified congenital heart disease and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Then uh, unspecified chromosomal abnormalities, Edwards syndrome and Patau syndrome. There are certain congenital anomalies which are lethal at birth. That is, they can cause neonatal and infant mortality. Uh, so these include anencephaly, severe meningomyelocele, multicystic dysplastic kidney, non-immune high drops with major cardiac defects, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and congenital severe diaphragmatic hernia. So there are, and there are certain congenital, congenital anomalies which are detected at birth, uh, and, but they do not cause death at birth, but the child can survive up to childhood, leading to death during childhood itself. So these include Duchenne muscular dystrophy, tetralogy of palate, transposition of great arteries, that is TGA, coaptation of iota, hydrocephalus, neural tube defects, lung malformation, cystic fibrosis. In GI disorders, you can have diaphragmatic hernia, gastrochysis, intestinal and biliary atresia, and renal agenesis. And there are congenital anomalies, uh, which can be considered minor, with survival in adulthood. They will have different set of issues which will be bothering them. So they are uh, ASD, BSD, Down syndrome, spina bifida, cystic fibrosis and minor anomalies which can lead to normal life such as club foot and syndactyly, polydactyly. So what are the palliative care uh, issues in each of these populations? So prenatal or in utero death. So in these patients, the major palliative care uh, components which needs to be addressed are counseling of the parents and the family, the grief and bereavement support and offering genetic counseling to parents so that future prenatal deaths can be avoided. And uh, for the congenital anomalies, which are lethal at birth, uh, that they, for them, the palliative care issues would be discussing advanced directives with parents at the time of antenatal diagnosis and uh, symptom management, memory making if the child, the family decides to continue with the pregnancy uh, and, uh, and delivery plan. And if, and as the child progresses during the neonatal peri uh, period, uh, then offering grief and bereavement support during that period and offering genetic counseling to parents, again, to prevent uh, neonatal and infant mortality next or future pregnancy. Then if the, uh, for the uh, anomalies which are detected at birth or later with death during childhood, the common issues would be symptom management, discussing prognosis as the disease progresses, start advanced care planning soon after diagnosis as some of these diseases are diagnosed postnatally, and providing caregiver and sibling support and as the disease progresses, uh, you go for grief and bereavement counseling. And for the congenital anomalies which survive in adulthood, the major palliative care issues would be realistic prognostication, monitoring for symptom worsening, and providing appropriate symptom management, discussing advanced care planning soon after diagnosis, as they are detected uh, late in the childhood sometimes, and um, reinforcing advanced directives in case of disease progression and genetic counseling of the patient as well as that of parent. So uh, coming to a brief overview of perinatal palliative care, the antenatal palliative care was already uh, discussed in the last class. So I'll be just giving a brief overview in the per perinatal period. So perinatal periods includes prenatal, during birth and after birth, that is neonatal period. So it's a multidisciplinary management, which includes uh, the role of uh, obstetrician, fetal or maternal me uh, medicine specialist, and the labor and delivery nurse and neonatal transport nurse in the prenatal period. And during birth, you need the role of neonatolo neonatologist, pediatric subspecialist, palliative care specialist, and a bereavement coordinator and social worker. In the neonatal period, there is role of neonatal nurse, neonatal practitioner, child life specialist, hospice staff, and discharge coordinator at the time of discharge. So what are the benefits of perinatal palliative care? So families feel supported in decision-making throughout the pregnancy. There is decreased parental anxiety and stress. Families able to fully experience the birth of their child and bond with the child. It enhances coping with the death of the baby. The infant is offered equal dignity as that is offered to any other terminally ill individuals. And there is expertise of a team who is comfortable explaining palliative care options and have experienced this with other families before when the uh, uh, palliative care specialist is involved. So how do you uh, implement a perinatal palliative care? So it can be summarized in the following five components by providing ongoing support from the type of di diagnosis through the pregnancy, delivery, and death of the infant by allowing time and privacy with the child, encouraging activities to promote bonding, memory making, and sibling involvement, 
providing comfort measures to the child depending upon the symptoms the infant may be having and supporting parents to develop a plan for the birth and care after birth of their child so how do you break a bad news in a scenario with congenital anomalies so it is important to understand that parents value direct clear and caring communication about what to expect and in case of children who are able to understand about their illness giving children permission to talk about illness and care of themselves demonstrates confidence in their ability to cope and allows for correction of potentially distressing misperceptions that the child may have and this is the principal determinant of quality of care so who should who are the issuers and receivers of bad news so obstetrician should be the issuer in case of antenatal diagnosis and pregnant women who is who who is affected should be the first to receive the message along with their partners and in case of a postnatal diagnosis the pediatrician or primary treating physician should be provider of the bad news to the parents and what bad news is communicated in the prenatal diagnosis it usually means that a decision must be taken whether or not to interrupt the pregnancy as soon as the congenital malformation is diagnosed so it is advisable to give immediate notice of the discovery of bad news and to inform the patient of all the alternative options available and it is important to make them understand that whatever the prognosis is, is there the availability of resources to control the symptoms and to ensure the best quality of life and comfort it should be stressed upon so how this information is communicative we are all aware of the spikes protocol so the setting to uh, break a bad news about the congenital malformation the setting should be a private setting uh, and uh, you have to ask the parents about their perceptions about the congenital anomalies and invite them uh, to provide this knowledge and once you impart them with the knowledge of a congenital malformation you give them time to uh, process that knowledge and uh, empathize with their emotions and ultimately provide them with all the possible strategies that are available to manage uh, during the antenatal and the postnatal periods and summarize the session in children uh, when they are able to understand they they have certain psychological perceptions about it so it is important to address their needs as well while break, while breaking the bad news so a child less than 2 years of age does not have any concept of death and the treatment must be aimed at providing physical comfort for a child 2 to 7 years of age they see death as a reversible process so in those children it is important to minimize separation anxiety and to deal with the feelings of guilt that they might have uh, by seeing the parents in a lot of distress uh, for a child who is 7 to 12 years of age they understand the permanence of death and they may suffer from guilt abandonment and fear of body mutilation and in adolescent patients with congenital malformations they face a struggle between a need to be independent and possibly worsening physical symptoms and lack of control so these uh, these issues need to be addressed while um, uh, providing palliative care to the uh, family suffering with congenital malformation coming to advanced care planning so advanced care planning in pediatric population uh, the healthcare practitioner has an obligation to share valuable information as parents and children may not be overtly aware of the potentials for dying until the discussion is initiated because uh, though not many are aware about congenital malformations during the time of pregnancy so it is the responsibility of the practitioners to provide them with that information and most parents they want physicians to discuss advanced care planning options so that they can help them make a decision and it is important uh, and also to understand that if the patient and family do not appear to be ready to address advanced care planning particularly when death is not imminent then respect for autonomy and parental authority includes the option of allowing them to refuse the information and defer decision making at that point in time so how do you go about advanced care planning in patients um uh, in such patients so there is a dimmer switch model and in an on and off switch model an on and off switch model is you provide palliative care and you stop it and then when the need for the palliative care arises then you the palliative care is again provided at that point in time the dimmer switch model is such that palliative care measures are in, introduced simultaneously with potentially curative treatments so or potentially uh, prolonging life prolonging options so in that case as the need arises the switch becomes brighter that is the palliative care which is provided increases as the disease progresses so this is the dimmer switch model and uh, you have to discuss advanced care planning only uh, and to discuss advanced care planning only in acutely life threatening situations is discriminatory as you will be able to provide uh, palliative care in uh, to patients who are only 
in critical illness before the preterminal phase and a lot of population would be left without palliative care so these discussions should occur early and regularly throughout the course of treatment ideally before a crisis arises and as the goals of care are clarified and change over time so you can include a larger number of population and address the needs of a larger population uh, with congenital malformations if you go about this approach and decisions should be reviewed and revised on a regular basis as the medical condition and knowledge of treatment and prognosis evolve such as a disease with sma the new drugs are still coming up and there is a lesser data available so the knowledge should be continuously reviewed and prognosis and prognostication should be done uh, based on that so coming to uh, the issues of withholding withdrawing treatment in, in the matter of child so uh, the royal college physicians and british medical associations they have given a five set situation where uh, in a children where in a child withholding and withdrawing treatment might be considered appropriate so these five conditions are a brain dead child a permanent vegetative state and three situations that is no chance no purpose and unbearable situation so what is a no chance situation a no chance situation is such that severity of the condition is such that life sustaining treatment simply prolongs the process of dying without alleviating the suffering and no purpose situation is despite the possibility of long term survival it is felt that it is unreasonable to expect the children to bear burden of physical or mental impairment and such a child will never be able to participate in treatment related decisions uh which includes um certain chromosomal abnormalities with uh, intellectual disability and neonatal mortalities and unbearable situations are condition that is both progressive and irreversible so the child on and of family feel that the burden of burden of further treatment is so great that any potential benefit is irrelevant so in these five conditions uh, the physicians can think of uh, withholding withdrawing treatment and discussing these practices with the parents so grief and bereavement issues in patients with congenital anomalies so first coming to the child the chronically ill child may experience personal bereavement even before their death why because there is loss of normal childhood uh, there is sadness at seeing how their family struggle to look after them and there is losses suffered as they see their own health deteriorate knowing that this represents loss of function of their body with a threat of death approaching especially children more than Five years of age, they start understanding this. For parents, they may need to grieve the anticipated death of their child before they are able to assist their child in the grieving process. And many parents have to combine grief with guilt, particularly in case of genetic disorders. They think that they have given the child this dis disorder, so that guilt needs to be addressed. And uh, ultimately, you have to negotiate a balance between the parents' need and the child's need. and this is uh, done by reflective listening and empathetic response how so how how do you go about the grief uh, uh, managing bereavement in such patients by listening in a non judgmental way by helping parents maintain a link with the child through memory boxes and helping parents to look at grief process as a journey of steps and not something that has to be tackled all in one go and you do not ignore siblings in this because sibling support is very necessary and this can be addressed by communication by using group therapy talk therapy uh, musical therapy and art therapy in siblings so coming to the next section that is the common congenital anomalies encountered in the practices and overview and uh, we'll be discussing in the following categories congenital heart disease neurodevelopmental disabilities musculoskeletal anomalies chromosomal anomalies and metabolic anomalies i'll be taking a sample case of each of these conditions so coming to critical congenital heart disease so what is a critical congenital heart disease uh, a congenital heart disease is said to be critical when the conditions affecting cohort of patients require a surgical intervention before discharge from the hospital after birth so a prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart disease improves outcome by reducing mortality and morbidity in affected fetuses so prenatal screening is important and early detection also allows for prenatal counseling family grief and acceptance as well as giving them an option if pregnancy termination of option of pregnancy termination if an acceptable outcome postnatally is unlikely and the early involvement of palliative care in this case allows providers to establish a relationship with the family and provides a continuity of care supporting both short and long term decision making with uh, along with other sub specialists so this is a br uh, brief overview of um, 
a neonate uh, who might be experiencing certain uh, symptoms and assessment is found to have uh, a congenital heart disease uh, or any other uh, non cardiac issue then uh, if the child is having cyanotic congenital heart disease the management would depend upon um, the type and the symptom severity at that point in time and similarly for non cyanotic heart disease uh, if there is obstruction is present then uh, and the situation is critical then management would depend upon that so you can go about this uh, flow chart and but what are the palliative cares for uh, palliative care triggers for initiating a consultation in patients with congenital heart disease why will a why should a pediatrician or a, a cardiologist call you for a palliative care consent, consent for a congenital heart disease patient so these are the triggers that they should be aware of so any lesion which is associated with single ventricle physiology uh, heart congenital heart disease which is associated with genetic syndromes or comorbidities such as trisomy 13 trisomy 18 and down syndrome symptomatic heart failure or significant myocardial dysfunction any patient which is being considered for cardiac transplantation and patients requiring mechanical circulatory support such as ecmo or ventricular assist device that is vad any a uh, child meeting an indication for an implanted cardiac defibrillator uh, that is icd and in patient in whom there is controversy about the appropriate intervention or uncertainty or eventual outcome example biventricular rehabilitation of borderline single ventricle lesions so in these cases if there is controversy whether to go for aggressive intervention or not in such cases also palliative care should be provided uh, and sought for but there are certain barriers which might prevent the physicians from uh, taking a palliative care consult so keeping that in mind we have to address that as well so clinicians why do they not seek palliative care uh, consults in congenital heart disease patients because uh, clinicians find the provision of end of life and palliative care to be more distressing in younger patients and the nature of congenital heart disease is such that uh, the physician prides itself on advances in life prolonging measures and hence professionals tend to avoid do not resuscitate dis, uh, discussions and other similar anticipatory planning and some patients are awaiting transplantations and that by definition keeps hope alive and sometimes uh, give concept of palliative care is that uh, it is towards end of life care so recognition of dying phase is difficult in these patients and it can be if, uh, difficult to prognosticate so they do not uh, so they are in a dilemma whether to seek or not to seek and ultimately they do not seek a palliative care consultations in such cases in majority of majority of the time coming to uh, the neurological uh, anomalies that is uh, the case i'd be taking is that of spinal muscular atrophy so what is sma progressive muscle weakness due to degeneration of nerve cells in anterior horn of spinal tract and brain stem nuclei the common three subtypes are sma type 1 2 and 3 type 1 is the most severe one where it is diagnosed within 6 months of the birth type 2 is diagnosed with, uh, at 6 to 12 months of age and type 3 is diagnosed after 12 months of age and uh, the signs and symptoms usually occur uh, with weakness at birth there is poor poor muscle tone muscle weakness lack of motor development mild contractures feeling difficulties and uh, breathing difficulties and in type 1 the death usually occurs less than 2 to 3 years of age in type 2 there is progressive weakness poor posture and in type 3 it is less severe and uh, proximal muscle weakness occurs first and this progressive weakness type 2 leads to death during early infancy and type 3 leads to death during childhood so uh, this is a brief overview of the medical management of uh, patients with sma so if there is smn1 mutation which is diagnosed then you go for gene therapy if smn2 uh, splicing is there then you go for antisense uh, oligonucleotides low level of smn transcripts are there then you increase the number of smn gene transcripts by using hydroxyurea in case of smn deficiency you goes of uh, you can use a role of uh, proteasome inhibitors if there is motor neuron loss then you use neuroprotective therapy such as rilazole which is also used in motor neuron disease and neuromuscular junction uh, to improve the function you can go for salbutamol pyridostigmine and in case of muscle atrophy you uh, you can use a myostatin inhibitors so this is a clinical picture of a child with sma uh, so this is an infant with uh, sma where the uh, where there will be a bright alert face despite weakness elsewhere weak cry absent deep tendon reflexes poor head control paradoxical breathing pattern and floppiness in the arms and legs which may result in frog like posture of the child uh, of the infant 
and in case of um, children with sma that is usually type 3 uh, there is a re- relative sparing of the facial muscles but the hand tremors are present deep tendon reflexes are absent in late stage tongue fasciculations are present and there is pro- proximal muscle weakness in the limbs so this was a study uh, which assessed the palliative care in sma type 1 and they said that 70% patient died at the median age of 6 uh, months and uh, 85% of the patients received enteral nutrition through gastrostomy and a significant uh, and 16% had a non invasive ventilation at the time of their death so the palliative manage- management occurred more frequently at home with increased level of technical support and why increased technical support because of enteral nutrition oxygen dependent uh, th- oxygen therapy and analgesic and sedative treatments and there was no significant uh, difference uh, in the patients who were analyzed prospectively and retrospectively during the end stage of life uh, the newer drugs which are coming up in the field of sma are new new synersin and uh, the dr- patients who were on these disease modifying treatments uh, they had more uh, invasive supportive care com- compared to those patients who did not receive these disease modifying treatment so the treatment uh, uh, with these new modifying dis- uh disease modifying drugs uh, the role of palliative care will change um in the future so that needs to be kept in mind coming to the next disease that is duchenne muscular dystrophy the average age of diagnosis is 5 years the early signs uh, of dmd are the inability to run positive trendelenburg sign gowers maneuver perk signs of progression are lumbar lordosis waddling gait equinovarus deformity and the child is usually wheelchair bound uh by 12 years of age and late signs are contractures severe kyphoscoliosis and respiratory problems so this is a brief overview of a management of plan with a male child with dmd uh, so uh, diagnostic tools which are available are genetic testing creatinine kinase and interventions which are available are genetic counseling and family support for rehabilitation you have to assess the range of motion the posture function alignment and uh, the interventions which are available are stretching positioning splinting orthosis standing devices and manual wheelchairs ortho uh, orthopedic management which is available are uh, using uh, assessment of range of motion using spinal ra- spinal assessment spinal radiograph and bone density measurements and you can go for tendon surgery posterior spinal fusion for psychosocial management you have to assess the coping and neurocognitive skills presence of an autism disorder and the management includes psychotherapy pharmacotherapy and supportive educational support for cardiac issues since these patients later land up in cardiac failure so you the tools available are ecg and eco and you can go for heart failure medications such as ace inhibitors for pulmonary management these patients land up with recurrent respiratory tract infections so uh, uh, and respiratory muscle weakness occurs uh, because of respiratory uh, muscle weakness so volume recruitment exercises tracheost and in later stages tracheostomy tubes and mechanical insufflators or exsufflators can be used for gi difficulties um the role is that of early role of dietitian involvement diet con- control and supplementation and management of gerd in constipation and corticosteroid management is depends upon the age of the patient the stage of the disease and um side with side effect monitoring and dose alterations if the side effects occur so this was a study which uh, which was conducted which showed uh, palliative care services in patients with males with male, uh, muscular and uh, dystrophy which includes both dmd as well as Be- becker muscular dystrophy so 91% of the caregivers use at least one palliative care services and the most of the consultation was sought for case management <coughs> excuse me so while research suggests that pain is a frequent problem in duchenne and becker muscular dystrophy only 12.5% of the cases uh, used pain management services so this is very less although case palliative care services were sought in 91% but only 12.5% uh, were that for pain management coming to uh, next uh, syndrome that is trisomy 18 edwards syndrome so it is characterized by low birth weight growth retardation and 50% die within first week of life and 95% within first year of life so phys- physical appearance is that of microcephaly micrognathus chest wall deformity clenched hand neurological deficits include mental retardation and seizure disorders cardiac complications include congenital heart disease of various type and renal uh, complications include polycystic kidney and miscellaneously patients might have coloboma umbilical hernia and diastasis recti so uh, this study explored the palliative care input pro- 
uh, in Belfast to those with Edwards and Patau syndrome and found that 66% had a palliative care documentation plans because they were diagnosed antenatally. And there is poor prognosis for babies born with Edwards and Patau syndrome, which highlights the need for a clear documented care plan from the moment of diagnosis, either antenatally or postnatally, because of a poor outcome in such patients. So how do you manage a case with trisomy 18 and 30? So experience and training team uh, believes purely palliative care is the correct treatment modality. So that has to be established at first. So, so once that is established that pure palliative care is the treatment modality, the medical team educates the family regarding perinatal palliative care. The condition is verified at birth uh, and after birth and the goal is the quality of life. So it is shared with parents upon diagnosis, either prenatally, intrapartum or postmortem and the family meetings are held with social workers, medical and nursing staff and case management services. And uh, infant is immediately offered comfort care and the team observes the infant for assures uh, all uh, to assure excellent care for all comfort needs. The parent desires to continue pregnancy at birth, then a birth plan is developed and resuscitative, resuscitative efforts are offered only if the physicians themselves wish to verify a complex diagnosis and to allow family from distance to arrive at the hospitals. So that time the child has to be kept alive. So family receives intensive medical support from all medical and ancillary services. And uh, if the parents desire to spend time with the infant and family, then the medical team shares with the parents with intensive comfort uh, uh, management. And if that is not available at their centers, then the child needs to be transferred to a center where this facility is available. And, and for families who wish surgical procedures are available, then the child should, then the surgical procedure should be done. And the child remains in hospital with concentration and quality of time with the child and uh, allowing a dying, dignified and peaceful death. And if the child is discharged at home, then hospice or home health team to follow up with the child uh, is needed. Coming to the next case, that is mucopolysaccharidosis. So it is a genetic lysosomal storage conditions. Most com There are uh, around seven types of MPS. Type three, that is MPS three San Filippo syndrome, which is the most common type. Other type one is Hurler syndrome and type two is Hunter syndrome. So the child is that, with coarse facial faces and the common uh, problems which are encountered are osteoarticular issues are uh, kyphoscoliosis, hip dysplasia, genu valgum. ENT issues are uh, enlarged tonsils, hearing loss, uh, otitis media. Uh, neurological issues are um, nerve entrapment syndrome, spinal cord compressions and abnormality in ventricular system and white matter. Ocular uh, disturbances include corneal clouding, optical disc swelling. Orodental issues are mandibular hy hypoplast uh, hypoplasty, uninterrupted teeth, supernumerary teeth, and high arch palate. Cardiac issues are pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathy. Respiratory issues are recurrent uh, respiratory tract infections, and other in includes uh, delayed puberty and hirsutism. So, what are the med uh, medical manage? What is the medical management available for mucopolysaccharidosis? So, there is diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis. Once the child is born and the clinical signs and symptoms are suspected of a metabolic uh, abnormality, then a new uh, screening is done where there is enzyme assay, GAG assay, and gene mutation. And a diagnosis of MPS is made. So once the MPS is diagnosed, the treatment options which is available is that of hematopoietic stem cell transplant and enzyme replacement therapy. So uh, stem cell transplant is a permanent solution. Enzyme replacement therapy has to be done continuously. And along with these two ther therapies, the palliative care has to go simultaneously. And future gene therapy is available, which can cure it. And uh, hence uh, the palliative care scenario might change in that case. So that has to be kept in mind. After discussing childhood uh, congenital malformations uh, with a brief overview, I would be coming to adults with congenital anomalies. So available research for adults with uh, is CHD, that is ACHD. Uh, they say that even with optimal surgical and medical ACHD management, the resultant medical and surgical complexities still lead to frequent hospital admissions, significant psycho psychological distress, persistent risk of premature heart failure related mortality. And hence a proactive advanced care planning and end of life discussions among ACHD patients and their surrogates are a class two way recommendations from American Heart Associations and American College of Cardiology 2018 guidelines. And coming to uh, neurological diseases, example, cerebral palsy, which survived till, uh, adulthood, uh, you, the specific issues are anticipatory guidance, which includes advanced care planning, supported living, and guardianship. And 
monitoring for conditions which require frequent follow up and treatment such as epilepsy hearing or visual loss respiratory ins insufficiency hypertension nutritional problems kidney stones fatigue and depressions care coordination among uh, care coordination immunization and keeping in mind that there is progressive impairment as the neurological disease progresses such as there is loss of previously attained skills and changes in behavior coming to chromosomal anomaly which survive till adulthood that is down syndrome so signs of aging and dementia occur uh, early in these patients and at a much younger age and there is a different pattern usually the pattern which is of dementia which is seen in down syndrome is that of alzheimer's disease so that has to be kept in mind and there is mid life mortality which is most commonly occur because of pulmonary disease and and uh, problems related to congenital cardiac defects and although no guidelines exist for end of life uh, in down syndrome uh, and hence um, it but it is uh, to be kept in mind that a precipitous decline uh, occurs in such patients and care is usually complicated by behavioral and assessment difficulties as well as caregiver issues uh lastly coming to common symptoms that these uh, set of patients may have and the common what uh, and their assessment and management that is pain dyspnea gi symptoms neurological psychological and skin symptoms for pain the child for in children less than 4 years of age you can have a uh, flax scale and behavioral observation scale for children 3 to 7 years of age we have faces scale and color analog scale and poker chip tool for children more than 8 years of age they uh, are usually able to tell their pain rating by numerical rating scale and verbal rating scale so this is the flax scale which can be used in children uh, which flax stands for face like activity cry and consolability where a score more than 7 or 10 stands for severe discomfort wong baker face scale is again an observational scale where the child points how much uh, they are hurting coming to assessment of pain in children you have a neonatal infant pain scale where uh, you take the facial expression cry breathing pattern arms legs and state of arousal into account and for premature infants there is uh, uh, in the indicators includes gestational age and observing the patient for 15 seconds for alertness recording their heart rate and spo2 and monitoring them for frowned forehead eye squeeze and nasal labial furrow the score usually ranges from 0 to 21 points and the score more than 12 indicates the presence of moderate to severe pain in the premature infant so we are all aware that uh, there is no role of weak opioids in pediatric patients from a non opioid the pain increases then you have to uh, step up to a strong opioids and it is a multimodal uh, management that is besides using the role of analgesics you go for a use of integrative therapy in children and uh, along with psychological therapies and rehabilitative measures uh, for each condition which we have already tried to provide overview upon these are the doses for uh, commonly used analgesics in these age groups you can go through this i will uh, the most common drug for strong uh, uh, for severe pain is uh, morphine the oral dose for which is 0.5 to 0.3 mg per kg in children and iv dosing is usually 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg per hour of infusion with bolus dosing of 0.025 to 0.05 mg per kg and these are the adjuvant drug which are used in the settings and their doses that is amitriptyline carbamazepine gabapentin diazepam and steroids coming to management of dyspnea so uh, the management will depend upon the cause if there is muscle weakness then not much is available but you can go for nocturnal ven ven uh, ventilation and tachycardia management in these children for fluid you go for antibiotics and anticholinergics for pressure on the airway go for steroids and stenting and in cancer patients go for radiotherapy and chemotherapy for pain analgesic management if there is pneumothorax and effusion then we drain that for management of cough we go for opioids and um, hemoptysis management is done by using ethamsalet and tranexamic acid for death rattle reducing parental uh, parenteral fluids to 50% uh, maintenance fluids in end of life has to be shown to be beneficial and using anticholinergics such as hyoscine patch and subcutaneous subcutaneous hyoscine has shown to be beneficial coming to gi symptoms that is nausea and vomiting uh, depends upon the cause if the cause is because of bowel wall damage then you can use ondansetron or metoclopramide for central causes you use cyclizine and dexamethasone for opioid induced nausea and vomiting the drug of choice is usually haloperidol for metabolic causes you use metoclopramide and dexamethasone and uh, for reflux dopamine antagonists are preferred and if there is no drug which is being um, useful then you can use a broad spectrum antiemetic such as levomipromazine for anorexic ataxia management you treat the correctable cause use smaller portions and smaller plates 
involve the dietitian early and use food supplementation such as omega 3 fatty acids and you can also try an anabolic steroids for a short 5 to 7 day burst therapy uh for uh, management of constipation you can use a stool softener uh, osmotic laxatives such as lactulose surfactants such as docosates and stimulant laxatives such as senna and bisacodyl for diarrhea you have to rule out and treat possible infection first and go for fluid and electrolyte replacement at the same time and the drugs which can be used are loperamide for neurological symptoms for seizures uh, you can use a anti epileptic depending upon the type of seizure if it is idiopathic then valproate for partial seizures you can go for phenytoin and carbamazepine absence seizures ethosuximide for spasticity you can go for surgical interventions botox injections and drugs such as paclofen tizanidine and diazepam for myoclonus go for opioid rotation and benzodiazepines and chorea is usually managed with a bed rest in quiet dark room and the drug which can be used is valproate dystonia is managed with anticholinergic drugs coming to psychological symptoms uh, depression is usually uh, managed by structured interview open communication psychological therapy medications which can be used in children are tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline and the only ssri which is approved for use in pediatric patients is fluoxetine for management of anxiety you can go for good communication art therapy music therapy and medications such as benzodiazepines and antidepressants and at the end of the life the child or the patient is suffering from terminal delirium then you identify reversible causes and treat them with drugs such as haloperidol and uh, levomipromazine for symptomatic relief and for sedation purposes you can add benzodiazepines combined with haloperidol and not use them alone uh, coming to last set of symptoms that is skin symptoms uh, pruritus and pressure sores are pressure sores are the common symptoms which are enc uh, encountered by this set of patients at the end of the life and uh, for pruritus you treat the possible cause you cut nails and use mittens mild steroid cream may be helpful uh, along with the use of nsaids and h1 antihistamines Uh, if the itch is caused by opioid, then you can use a serotonin antagonist. For pressure sores, the main strategy is prevention by early aggressive intervention. So you regularly turn the patient, and uh, pressure relieving measures are used and manage nutritional status because that uh, increases the healing. And then use appropriate dressing in stage one when the only the skin is eroded. You use an occlusive dressing. For light exudate, you can use alginate and uh, hydrochloride dressing. for heavy exudate again you can use hydrochloric and alginate dressings and if the cavity has formed at the site of a pressure sore then foam dressings are used so this end my symptom management and i would like to end the seminar by a giving overview about future perspectives that is there is very limited literature which is available on perinatal palliative care and adults with congenital anomalies so this provides an opportunities to integrate at the time of diagnosis and continue uh, as disease progresses with evolving goals of care and this can be done by creating educational opportunities to provide awareness among obgs pediatrician cardiologists and neurologists thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you neha uh, so we have tried to cover the uh, various aspects of uh, patients who are suffering from congenital heart disease though there was no classification but uh, when we were reviewing the literature for uh, various group of these patients uh, we could realize that we can categorize into uh, the groups and their requirement was quite different which neha has mentioned in one of the uh, uh, slides also so that is in front of you so this classification i think uh, <clears throat> we need to research it further because this is just we have made it to put them into groups and uh, possibly we can take it forward to look for that uh, what type of uh, specific intervention uh, next slide neha so what type of specific intervention would be required for this group of patients and that will make them comfortable so this is open to house and any questions or comments or their experience uh, somebody has has their own experience they can share it so what i suggest uh, uh, rakesh that uh, there are few people those who are already already working started in the area of neonatal palliative care like uh, first i can say that dr seema and sanjeev they were involved in uh, one of our patients management of patau syndrome so if they want to share their experience and then if there is anyone from the dr gayatri uh, team uh, from mnj i think uh, they are more uh, we would like to hear from them because they have also started neonatal palliative care so uh, seema or sanjeev would you like to share the patau syndrome experience and your our integration of uh, palliative care in neonatal palliative care
they are not there they are there ma'am madam is there uh, dr shima mishra ma'am uh, can you just share your experience regarding the uh, congenital uh, syndrome of patau and how did you manage it overall experience of integration that what was the experience by the time madam comes there is a question that uh, what is uh, because you were discussing about uh, including the children also in understanding their disease and uh, they should be a part of team while we are explaining them the disease progression so neha can you elaborate uh, that what should be the appropriate age to break bad news in children so uh, the the appropriate age to break bad news in children usually adolescents are the one they ask uh, to be involved because they are all, uh, they are in that phase that they are not able to uh, in, the, in the position of authority to make a decision about themselves so they Uh, believe there is a sense of lack of control so that needs to be addressed and hence uh, including them as part of decision making is important uh, for adolescent for ch child less than uh, adolescent age group uh, they understand the permanence of death but they do but uh, giving them information about the disease progression uh, at the time of breaking bad news they might not understand they might not have that much of understanding and children less than 5 years of age they do not have understanding so uh, physical comfort measures uh, are what is needed for them so i think same question uh, by dr divya also can you explain uh, perception of death in different age groups so i think uh, she has very nicely mentioned that the perception of death will be taken in a different way into these patients so when the uh, breaking of bad news is done we need to understand the uh, understanding of a that particular age group child and accordingly uh, they can be uh, we can go ahead to make them understand that what is going to happen and what is their real expectations or real uh, uh, once we start planning with them so they can be a part of it uh, and the understanding would be different and different uh, age groups of these patients and simultaneously as neha has very nicely mentioned in one of the slides that we also need to understand that uh, they may not be having uh, uh, similar age related development of the not only of the physical aspect but of the neurological aspects also of the and that's why the understanding may be differing in these patients uh, dr vikram mentioned 7 years the age where age perception that that is irreversible so this is one of the uh, uh, age where the child probably could start understanding that what is going to happen with him on the background of uh, the underlying disease So Sanjeev Seema, would you like to share to put out your experience? So uh, I don't know what is wrong, but uh, I can share that uh, they have shared with me uh, what are they doing in neonatal palliative care. So once we have started planning that uh, there should be a good integration of. Uh, palliative care with the neonatal uh, group of people uh, we started approaching them uh, mainly seema and uh, one of residents sanjeev were going there and i think one or two more resident must be involved and uh, uh, i think there is a huge interest amongst neonatologists they want to they want to learn palliative care and they want to integrate palliative care because uh, uh, the our team has proved With the with the two or three of their patient, that how palliative care can be helpful. And one patient was, I, I just told you about the Patau syndrome. Only problem comes that uh, when palliative care team involves, they try to make them understand that futility of treatment, which uh, uh, I think uh, as a as a um, uh, this thing that they don't uh, uh, they don't. Uh, accept this this they miss not uh, parents but even the physicians they don't uh, accept this because they keep thinking that patient the child will be all right and uh, they should not uh, be, uh, withheld or withdraw or decrease the support something like this so this was the experience they have shared but still interest is definitely there they really want because it was an initial stage this experience they uh, they have shared and uh, this was the challenge they have found when they were planning to integrate palliative care in neonatology uh, however there is a definitely a scope and you know in whole of the country all the medical colleges there is a department of obstetrics and uh, 
we see that there when there is a department observation many 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 children there must be there must be uh, this problem must be there and as neha said that there is almost 20 uh, one fourth uh, i think what 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 was the incidence neha I, i forgot there was some percentage you said that this these percentage of people uh, the page parents they, 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 there are incidence of uh, congenital malform uh, malformation i don't remember ma'am so, in india uh, 1.7 million every year every year so this is a huge huge need so uh, uh, i think definitely wherever we you are working in many wherever whichever institute especially the pgs uh, you should try to uh, integrate this concept in neonatal uh, palliative care definitely especially neonatal as well as patient with the congenital malformation it will be a huge help for patient and huge help for system so if uh, uh, if residents are here and the teachers are not there they should go and convey this message that today we have learned something like this and we should try to integrate and if teachers are there residents are not there then they should go and tell their residents that they should get rotated in this department so that they will have an idea only thing again i want to uh, emphasize that you should have a perfect knowledge about these pro pro problems because until unless you will not know anything about these small formations people will not uh, people will not believe you and whatever you have to talk you have to talk with evidence based because again uh, again people will not understand otherwise and they will not listen to you because if except counseling and except talking to the relatives i think they can also do but how you can integrate and how beautifully you can make them understand that this is very important part of uh, medical practice i think this will all depend on you and for that you have to learn all these small formation which neha has narrated beautifully well and this was a very important lecture for pgs so please go and read it again try to understand try to see that whether you find such such children in your setup and try to integrate this uh, in your day to day practice so rakesh final word if you want to say anything otherwise we can stop here hey, thank you ma'am i just we have two minutes left so i think uh, many things remains a uh, little gray area so further research can be done uh, in these areas where we can uh, specify according to the different subset of congenital heart disease and their need assessment can be done so that we can more focus on the uh, specific care to these patients and secondly this will always be as is for other cases of multidisciplinary management because some amount of uh, primary care physician uh, treatment would be required along with the palliative care physician for their for making their good quality of life so if any any questions uh, pending uh, there is no nothing in the chat if anybody wants to ask they can unmute and they can ask question we have two minutes left So, madam, uh, there is no question. So, can we? Uh, okay. So, we can stop here, and uh, I think this is absolutely last sentence which you said that it's a lot of gray areas, and there is a lot of scope of research in this area. So, I would like to see that from anywhere from India, whichever part, from some part of the India, there will be two three studies will come in this area also that palliative need assessment of palliative care, and uh, we'll do it definitely. so thank you very much thank you everyone for joining uh, we have to move for the next whole week we have to work so now we have only 2 minutes left so we will stop here and see you next week so next monday before 6:30 thank you rakesh thank you neha and uh, thank you nisha and archana and thank you everyone for joining thank you ma'am